Hey, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. We just finished the series, The Truth About You. And I hope you enjoyed uh, that series. I think I told you guys it kind of went a different direction than I thought it was going to go, but I absolutely loved it. And a couple of things that we learned or that we are learning, because sometimes we heard it, but we haven't quite fully learned it yet. Uh, But a couple of things that we learned in it is that you are not your past mistakes. You're not. I know the accuser is nonstop saying that to you. Now, he may just be putting the thought in your mind that you are this, that thing, or you missed the mark, or it may be somebody else that the enemy is actually using that is constantly reminding you of that past mistake, but you are not your past mistake. And I hope you start to believe that and just stand on that and just remind yourself when you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm that failure, that you're not. And the other thing is you are not the labels that other people have put on you. Or maybe you put on yourself that, man, I can't learn that kind of stuff. I hear people tell me this all the time. I try to read the Bible, but I just can't learn it. You actually can. And if you'll just stay consistently learning to read the word of God, suddenly the spirit man inside of you will begin to help you identify with the word of God. And you'll hear. So you're not those labels. All right. And one more thing is that you are bigger and stronger than any challenge that you face any difficulty that you face or any enemy that you face. You are bigger and stronger than that. That is the truth about you. And you have to believe that because if you don't, you'll think those things are bigger than you. You'll think the enemy is going to defeat you. The difficulty is going to defeat you or the challenge is going to defeat you, but you're bigger than that. So the reason why that understanding is so important is because in order for you and I to walk through the doorways of destiny that God actually has for us, we have to overcome the giant that is standing between us and our destiny. Now, there's two schools of thought when we think of that. The first one is, oh, Pastor Richie, I just can't anymore. I'm tired of fighting, and I understand. Man, we all go through times where we feel wore out from the fight, and that's, by the way, is one of the reasons why you need proper rest why you need to chill out and learn to take a step back, why you need people around you that can encourage you, that can speak life into you. When you're going, man, I think I'm going to give up. They're going, no, 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 you got this. Stay in there. So sometimes we think that, and then other times we're like, okay, let's go. I'm, I'm ready to face the giant because we're learning, like we learned last couple of weeks with David, that Goliath was actually his doorway to his destiny to the king. And, and we got to recognize that, that you, you have to make a decision that you're not going to run from the fight. Right. See, we talk about a life of faith, but the word of God teaches you and I that we are to fight the good fight of faith. Right. And some of you love that. Some of you, you're fighters. I mean, you know, somebody messes with you on the road and you're like, come on, bring it, buddy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> or somebody messes with you and you're ready to get into a fight. Others, maybe not so much, but we have to learn how to fight the good fight of faith. We have to learn how to exercise our faith. Faith is a muscle that you have to build up. It's not just enough for you to know what the word of God says. You have to learn how to activate and and exercise the word of God. Um, This past Friday, Pam and I went to what I'm calling the hit class from hell. And it was literally 45 minutes of nonstop hit exercises that we kept going and kept going and kept going. And um, since I'm a little ways past 40 now, I have learned to... um, Thank you for laughing. Um, I have kind of learned that I have to kind of pace myself a little bit more, but my wife, who's a young whippersnapper, hasn't learned that yet. And so we got up yesterday morning, and I'm, I'm sore because I'm exercising those muscles, but my wife can't hardly walk, so she doesn't go to the next hit class. And so you, you have to learn how to exercise muscles for them to get stronger. I mean, how many of you have learned that? You, you don't just naturally get uh, biceps or, or great muscles. You have to actually exercise the muscle. It's the same with faith. We've got to exercise our faith. Listen, and we have to decide before that, for the challenge that we're going to face to exercise our muscles. Because, it, it, and I like to use this analogy, if somebody broke into your home and you hadn't been working out and you, you weren't, didn't feel very strong, you couldn't reach under your bed and go, hey, let me lift some weights right now so I can beat up this person that's breaking into my home, right? You, you've got to be prepared ahead of time. So we have to make the decision ahead of time that when the storm comes, it, it's not a matter of if it's going to come, that when the storm comes, we're going to stand up and exercise our faith because sometimes life is going to take you by surprise. 
So, Richie, how do I exercise my faith? Well, when you get sick in your body, and just so you know, as Christ followers, even though we believe that we've been redeemed from the curse, sometimes we get sick. But you start standing on the word of God and you say, God, I thank you today that by your stripes, I'm healed. When a financial setback happens and you're suddenly your finances are being challenged, you know, don't, don't cave in and go, oh, this is the way it's always going to be. Just go, God, I thank you that your word says that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. When you begin to have some relationships that begin to, to be challenged, you go, God, I thank you that you're a God that restores. You fight the good fight of faith because sometimes life throws us some curveballs. Sometimes some challenges come up. One of our favorite vacations when my kids were growing up is that we loved to go camping. And we would go up into the woods in, in New Mexico and we'd camp in tents um, originally. And then when my wife said no more of that, we actually graduated to a camper. And uh, we were glamping at that point. I mean, it's pretty rough you, when you got satellite TV and a generator out there. It's just like, oh, it's so tough, right? <laughs> but, but, but we always enjoyed that and our kids always loved it. And one of the things we love to do is we love to ride dirt bikes. In fact, when Pam and I were just dating, uh, they asked me actually to go on a trip with them, and, and I watched my wife climb onto a dirt bike, kickstart it, and rev it up, and I thought, now this is a woman I could spend the rest of my life with. <laughs> and so we loved to ride dirt bikes, and I remember one time we, we rode our dirt bikes up to the top of the mountain because it was a gorgeous sunny day, and I thought, oh, this is going to be so fun. Rode up there, went up to a waterfall, hung out for a while, but on our way back, all of a sudden we saw these storm clouds coming in. And if you've ever watched storm clouds come in, a lot of times they can come in pretty quickly. And by, before we'd actually gotten back to camp, we're getting rained on. Yep. Then it began to hail. The temperature dropped about 30 degrees. We were freezing. We get back into the campsite course. We're ripping off all of our clothes, trying to get into warm clothes because life changes. Yeah. And, and that's the way life seems from sometimes. One minute you're enjoying the sunshine and the next moment you're getting hailed on. Right. There's a storm in your life. One minute you're loving your job, but in the next minute you might find yourself unemployed. One minute you're enjoying good health and the next minute you're dealing with some physical issues and some physical challenges. One moment relationships are great and the next moment seems like there's some challenges that are happening and some stress and some relationships. So life doesn't always go the way that we think it's always going to go. It just doesn't. Sometimes there are storms that seem to come up out of nowhere, and sometimes they can have devastating results. Yes, they, they can be a real challenge to our faith, and, and it often catches us off guard. It, it really does. It surprises us because we know how to trust God when things are going well, yeah. right? I mean, the family's doing well. The spouse is behaving. The kids are behaving. Yeah. The job's going great, the boss is nice, the employees are doing well, whatever it would be. We know how to trust God when things are going well, but we struggle to trust him in the middle of the storm. And so, see, storms don't actually steal our faith and trust in God. They actually just reveal the level of our faith and trust in God. Because it's easy for me when things are going well, going, God, I trust you, thank you. But in the middle of a storm, it reveals where I'm at with my faith and trust in God. Because we've got to understand that when the storms come into our life, you're going to have to decide ahead of time what you're going to do. You can decide now. What I, the way I like to say it is that you've got to remember in the dark what you learned in the light. And when things are going well, you can make a decision, God, I'm going to trust you in the middle of the storm. So that when the storm comes, again, it's not a matter of if, you can go, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I know that you've got this. I know that you haven't forsaken me. I know that you haven't abandoned me. God, I trust you. Because if you believe that the blessed and favored life that God wants for you, that I talk about all the time, is going to be free of storms and challenges... If that's what you think, the blessed life is just an easy life, oh, it's always wonderful, then you're going to find yourself anxious, fearful, worried, and afraid often. You are not going to be trusting God or believing his promises for your life if you think it's always easy. Because when it goes to challenge, you're going to go, God, what did I do wrong? God, why are you punishing me? God, why is this happening? And then you might start blaming other people. God, it's because of the people I'm around. So we've got to know ahead of time. So I, I want to start off today by asking you, does your faith in God work during the storm? M maybe a better way for me to put it for is where, what you're walking through right now, the, the thing that you're dealing with, the difficulty, is your faith in God working? Is it working? 
Have you already decided that you're going to trust God? Have you already made a decision, God, I'm going to trust you? Do, do you know what you're going to do when the storm comes? It's one of the most amazing things to begin to understand is that you can make decisions ahead of time of how you're going to respond. Sometimes I, I, in, in marriages, I see people dealing with the same problem over and over and over again. And we get in this doom loop where we start hitting on each other's pain cycle and we get stuck in it. But if you can decide ahead of time, listen, even if he or she says the wrong thing, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to respond correctly. And not in a self-righteous, pious, well, I'm going to respond correctly, all right? Because we do that, that doesn't work. But it's, I'm going to respond correctly. So they're unkind to me, I'm going to be kind back. You can decide ahead of time. Do you know what you're going to do when it doesn't go the way you think it should go? Do you, do you know what you're going to do when it doesn't happen when you thought it should happen? That it's not happening as fast as you think it should. Do you, do you know how to have faith or do you know how to exercise your faith in the middle of a storm? Because again, it's easy when things are going well, but can you do it during the middle of the storm? See, if you don't know how to exercise your faith in the middle of the storm, when the storm comes, it can become very easy for you to quit in the middle of the storm. So you'll quit on the marriage. You'll, you'll quit on God. You'll, you'll quit believing in his goodness towards you. It, it, listen, I don't, I don't know. If you don't know how to have faith in the middle of the storm, you may actually miss the miracle that God actually has for you. You may miss, again, going back to our analogy we looked at with King David, you may miss the opportunity to step into the kingdom or the, the next step that God has for you. And, and what you're going to find is that most storms are really going to take you by surprise. Yeah. They, they'll just come, seem to come out of nowhere. And even though Jesus said this in John 16, look at what Jesus is t talking to us, encouraging us. In this world, you will have trouble. Jesus told us that. Storms still take us by surprise. And, and a lot of times storms seem to follow right on the heels of this incredibly blessed time in your life. Think, things are going well and then all of a sudden there's a storm. This is what was actually happening to the disciples in this passage in Matthew chapter 14. This is the passage where Jesus, uh, we witnessed the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Many, many of you know this story, but can you imagine being there on that day? They're in this remote place, meaning there are no restaurants around. Right. Now, most of us can kind of identify with it a little bit. If you remember back a few years ago when COVID happened and we were like, what? There's no place I can go to dinner tonight? Because some of us live in restaurants, right? <laughs> the Bible says there were about 5,000 men plus women and children, meaning there were, could have been as possibly as many as 20,000 people that were there that day. And the only food that they could scrounge up are five loaves of bread and two fishes. That, that's all they can find. Listen, some of you are masters with taking leftovers and feeding your entire family. That's pretty impressive. But think about Jesus. He takes five loaves and two fishes, give thanks for it, breaks it, and then feeds 20,000 people. That's incredible. I don't know if you know, but that's a miracle. He, he does that. And, and then Jesus does something that, that when you read it in the context of the whole passage, you're kind of going like, okay, now, Jesus, why would you do that? And it's our verse today, Matthew 14, 22, and it says, immediately, right on the end of this big miracle, immediately. There, there's not accidental words, by the way, in the Bible. The, the writers just didn't go, let me just add immediately because I like that word. All right. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get in to the boat. Now, why would Jesus do that? I can, I can tell you as a pastor looking at that, he's having incredible success. Ministry is popping. Th things are happening. I mean, you've got overflow crowds. And I'm sure that Jesus' social media page, if, if he'd had it back then, is going crazy. I mean, he had probably gained about 20,000 instant followers from what had just happened, right? And I'm sure that everything Jesus is posting right now is going viral, People are retweeting it, reposting it because they just can't get enough of what Jesus is saying and, and what Jesus is doing. Are y'all catching the analogy? So why would Jesus do this? Here's why. Because he knows that sometimes our success can cause us to lose focus of what's really important. Sometimes our success can cause us to lose focus 
of what's really important because we have a tendency to want to live in our last success. That, that what we did before, we want to, we want to live there or, or where we currently are. We, we want to live there rather than taking our next step. Or, or understanding that Jesus is focused on a process more than he is our success. That life is a journey. It's not just a destination point. It has destination points along the way. But he's interested not just in, in the, 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 the success, but the process. See, because process takes us from where we are right now to where he wants us to be. And a lot of us wouldn't go through the process except Jesus makes us go through it. He, he takes us through it. And, and you'll find that there seems to be a lot of storms in our life that are a part of the process. They really are. Again, our, our storms are the gateway into our destiny. So avert, again, our verse, Matthew 14, 22, it says immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side as he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So these disciples, the, the success that they had just experienced, they now find themselves in the middle of the storm. Right. You ever find yourself there? Yes, yeah. You just had a success, just had a breakthrough. You're so excited about what's happening in life, and now you're finding yourself in the middle of the storm. Verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. I want to see that when I get to heaven. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. And Jesus immediately said to them, and I believe it's what Jesus would say to us also, is take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Yeah. Catch that last line again with me. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Yeah. Do you know that courage has to be taken it has to be taken hold of. Right. Courage does. You see, whenever you see somebody acting courageous, you see someone who has chosen to take hold of courage. Right. When, when you read stories about people that fought maybe in Vietnam or World War I and they did these courageous acts, they simply made a choice to overcome fear, overcome some things that were happening on the inside of them, and they took hold of courage. And what Jesus is contrasting here is courage with fear. Because if you don't take hold of courage, fear will take hold of you. Because in the moment when you get blindsided by something that happened in life, the immediate response that you feel is fear. God, how are we going to get out of this financial situation? God, how am I going to be healed? God, how is this going to get any better? But in that moment, you have to make a decision to take hold of courage and say, God, my trust is in you. God, my confidence is in you. Your word says, by your stripes, I'm healed. God, your word says, I'm the head and not the tail, that I'm above and not beneath. You got to stand on the word of God. Well, Pastor Richie, I don't know all the word of God. It's okay. Just start by saying what you know about the word of God. I promise you, God's not up in heaven going, boy, that was so close to the King James Version. I would have almost given you that if you'd said it quite right. He's not rating you, okay? Now, the more, the more you know it and the better you know it, the more right you will be, if that makes sense. But man, sometimes it's just, God, I know you're good. We got to declare the promises of God. So it's, it's interesting to me when we, we look at stories in the Bible that we often miss the grittiness of real life that is actually taking place. See, because many of us believe that the word of God is the inspired or the holy word of God, which, which it actually is. But we believe and often miss the reality TV that's going on. Right. Now, I know, if, I don't want to ask you to show of hands because some of you would raise your hand, but you watch the reality TV sometimes and you get behind the scenes, you see these couples fighting, you see them arguing at people, don't you, Brianna? Is that right? <laughs> we, we see these things. We, we often miss that life is like reality TV in the Bible played out in front of us. That, that people in the stories are, what people in the stories are dealing with is just real life. It, it really is because we believe that because something supernatural is happening, that they really didn't have a choice, that God just made them do it. That, that David didn't have a choice, God just made him go fight Goliath. But no, he, he had to rule through some things and over some things in his life. Because the stories that we find in the Word of God are filled with people who dealt with life just like us. 
They did. They, they dealt with the same things that we deal with. Yes, in, in fact, in Mark chapter 8, there's this incredible miracle where Jesus heals this blind man. And, and you can read the story. We, we can see the miracle, but miss out on the fact that this man had to exercise his faith in order to receive his miracle. He, he had to exercise his faith. In fact, if you want to read along with me in Mark chapter 8, verse 22, it says this, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Now, first of all, I love the fact that these friends brought this blind man to Jesus. You know, and we look at that story and we go, oh man, that's so cool they did that. Do you know you and I get to do that same thing every day of our lives? It may not be a blind man from they can't see with their eyes, but if they're not saved, they can't see with their heart. They don't understand God. And we get the opportunity to bring these blind people to Jesus. He took the blind man by the hand and watched this story and led him outside of the village. I want you to hold on to that because I'm going to come back to that. When he had spit on the man's eyes... Did y'all just read that with me? When he had spit on the man's eyes. Can you picture that just for a moment? Maybe you don't want to, but Jesus spit on the man's eyes. I was thinking about this week and I was thinking, how often do we want to sanitize what we want God to do in our life? That we want God to do some things in our life, but we want him to do it the way that we want him to do it. God, God, I'll do this if you don't embarrass me or if you don't, you know, if, if I don't have to actually share my faith or God, I'll... he spit on the man's eyes. He spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him. And Jesus asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people and they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes and then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Now, I don't wanna take anything away from Jesus because Jesus is our healer. He is our provider. He wants your life to be amazingly blessed. But you have to exercise your faith. And this man had to exercise his faith. If he hadn't have exercised his faith, he would have never received the miracle that Jesus was wanting for him. Right. Are, are y'all tracking with me? Yeah. Because when I talk about God blessing us and Christians are blessed, we think that that should just automatically show up. I, have, I don't have to believe it's just going to happen. No, you've got to believe and you've got to receive. That's why even when Pam was praying for us today, she said, do you believe that you're healed? You, you got to make a decision. Well, I've still got pain in my body. I know that's not what we ask you. Do you believe that you're healed? In other words, do you believe that healing has been provided for you? And I know it messes with us a little bit because we're so logical and pragmatic that we go, well, let me figure it out. If I, get, if I see the manifestation of it, then I'll believe that God has provided healing for me. But we have to believe in order to receive. Okay, I know that's stretching some of y'all's faith, but listen, this, this man would have, think about this for just a moment. Listen, this man is blind. Okay, and the Bible says in Mark 8, 23, again, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside of the village. And the man went. And again, we, we don't think about real life, but do you realize that this man is actually putting himself at risk? Listen, what if he gets out there and Jesus decides to leave him? Now, you and I know Jesus, and we know the story, so we go, oh, Jesus isn't going to do that. We know that. We're not in the middle of the story. What's it, what if he gets out there and Jesus is leaving? He would not be able to find his way back to town. He's blind. Are you all tracking with me? Can you imagine the thoughts that he possibly might have had to wrestle with? It's the same thoughts that you and I wrestle with when we can't see what God's doing. When God has taken us somewhere that we're unsure of where we're going. He, he, the potential thoughts of doubt, the, the potential thoughts of fear. Oh, oh my goodness, what am I getting myself into? The unbelief of, is Jesus really the Messiah? Can you imagine the things that this man possibly dealt with? He doesn't have a plan B. He, he doesn't. He de hadn't made arrangements for someone to help him back to the village if this doesn't work out. He, he doesn't have a plan B. He's going all in with God. God, I trust you. He's taking Jesus by the hand, meaning he's committed. Right. He's committed in trusting God. Yeah. Sometimes we're as committed as a kamikaze pilot on his 14th mission. Yeah. He's committed. Thank you. Y'all like that one better than the first service. Thumbs up to you guys. 
He's committed. He is expecting to be healed. He's heard about Jesus. Have we heard about Jesus? Have you heard about the, the, the figment Jesus or is Jesus real? He's heard about Jesus. And what he did, we saw that he did was he exercised his faith. He did. He took Jesus by the hand. And even though where he was being led was a little bit uncertain, he certainly walked with Jesus. Can I tell you, that's what it's like in our life. Every day we've got to take Jesus' hand and go, God, I, I'm not sure exactly where you're taking me today, but God, I trust you. God, I'm not, I'm not sure why there's been a rerouting of my life, but God, I trust you. God, I'm not sure because I can't see, but I know you can see. God, I'm trusting you. I mean, think about it. how many how many miracles do you and I miss out on? How many opportunities do we miss out on because we're not willing to take our next next step? That we, we miss out on friendships that God wants to bring into our life. That, that we miss out on healings that God wants to, to touch our bodies. We miss out on increase. We miss out on promotion. We miss out on being set free. The miracles that God wants to do in our life. Because Jesus has taken us by the hand and he's begun to lead us unto an unfamiliar path. And, and we can't see what he can see. Right. Man, it's one of the, the things I have to step back and remind myself all the time is I can't see what he sees. So I'm going to hold on to his hand. And, and, and we aren't sure exactly where he's taking us. So what we do too often is we stop and we let go of his hand. Right. Yeah. God, God, I took two steps with you and you didn't do it. So God, I'm out. Yeah. And we're unwilling to go any further with him. Or we, we argue with him. Now, it's not what we call it, but we, we talk to him like he's unsure about what's going on. God, do you know what's going on? Uh, yeah, creator of the universe. Knew you before the foundation of the world. Knew everything about you. Still know everything about you. Is this making sense? So instead of taking our marriage to the next level, Instead of taking our family to the next level, instead of taking our career to the next level, instead of taking our health to the next level, instead of taking our finances to the next level, we play it safe because right. we're stuck in a rut and we're comfortable in our rut. It, it is. It's comfortable. It's, it's familiar. It, it, what we don't recognize is we're living down here in a rut when level ground is up here. We're already living beneath our privileges. And, and let me remind you what a rut is. A rut is just a grave with the ends knocked out. Yeah. And we get stuck in a perpetual rut for the rest of our lives. So what if you and I started to exercise our faith? Right. Not just when things were well, but when things are challenging, going, okay, devil, I, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to mess with me. Yeah. But I'm ready to fight the good fight of faith. So the word of God says this. And you started declaring the word of God. What if, we started, what if we started believing the promises of God? Let me say it again. They are promises. They're not wishful thinking, hey, this might happen. Just check it out. What if we started believing the promises of God? In fact, let me give you a promise. Hebrews 5.5. 5, I will never leave you. This is God speaking. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if you ever feel abandoned by God, Hebrews 5.5, 5, you promise to never leave me nor forsake me. So God, I know that you're with me. I'm exercising my faith. My faith is getting stronger. What if we begin to decide, I believe that God's a good God. I believe that God wants to do some amazing things in our life. I believe that God's watching out for us. Because listen, even though he said in his word that in this world we will have trouble, again, John 16.33, in this world you will have trouble. He doesn't leave us there. Because he goes on to say, but take heart, I have overcome the world. If you're in him, that means you're an overcomer too. I I say it all the time, but you're not ever fighting for victory. You're fighting from a position of victory. And you may feel a little defeated and you may look a little defeated right now, but you're not defeated because the enemy is trying to get you to be defeated. So why would God tell us that? Why, why would God say that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world? Well, right before that, then the first part of that verse, he tells us why. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. That you and I can have peace. Peace is the, the referee, if you will, in our lives that constantly helps me recognize I've got my eyes on Christ. I've got my eyes on his goodness. I've got my eyes on his promises. Or I've got my eyes on my feelings. I've got my eyes on my problems. I've got my eyes on my challenges. See, it's in Christ that you're going to experience peace. It's not in living in your circumstances. It's not living in your situation. It's not living in your feelings. Peace is only found 
in Christ. So we have to make a choice. And we have to make a choice ahead of time to operate in courage, courageous faith so that when he takes us by the hand and when he begins to lead us, you have to make sure that your choice is to believe that he's still in control, that he's watching over you, that he knows what's going on. He knows where you're going. He knows what's happening. And catch this, he's going to do the miracle in our lives when he gets us to the place where he wants us to be. Yes. We want the miracle to show up today. God, if I start walking with you today, then I'm believing for the miracle today. Sometimes God has got to get us to the place outside of the village, if you will, to receive our miracle. Amen. That's what happened in this man's life. In fact, let's go back and look at that again in Mark chapter 8. He took the blind man by the hand, led him outside the village, and when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. And once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and then his eyes were open, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. So here's my closing questions to you for you to ponder and think about today. Can God get you to the place where he needs you to be so that he can do a miracle in your life? Can God get you to the place? Can, can you or will you exercise your faith by putting your faith and trust in him and in his promises? Will you exercise him? Will you get him stronger? Can, can you take him by the hand and allow him to lead you through the storm that you're currently experiencing? Can you stop letting go of his hand because fear is whispering in your ears, God doesn't know where you're at. God doesn't care where you're at. Can you not let go of his hand? Can, can you stop arguing with God about how he should do things, realizing that he's God and you're not? Can you get to the place where you have the courage to operate in faith? Can you get to the place where you're exercising your faith? I hope your answer to all those questions is not only I can, but I will. I will. Today's the first day of the rest of my life, and I may forget for a moment. I may get blindsided by something that I'm confessing the problem once again, but I'm going to adjust. I'm, I'm going to make some declarations over my life. I'm going to remind myself about God's promises. Because see, by, by taking hold of courage and choosing to walk out of courageous faith, you'll take your next step to position yourself for miracles. Amen. Every problem that we encounter is just an opportunity for God to show up in our lives in an incredible way. Because see, we either believe God's promises or we don't. That's where it comes down to. We're either going to take hold of courage or we're going to let fear take hold of us. So it's our choice. And, and by the way, it's one we have to actually choose every day, every moment of every day. In fact, we can't choose it in here today, walk out and go and it's set because life's going to happen to you tomorrow, the next week, the next month. And we have to choose it multiple times every day. Choose courage, choose to exercise your faith, choose to build up that faith muscle. So where's God leading you right now? Where, where, where is God, what has God been talking to you about? What, what do you think your next step to your destiny is? Is it to start praying? Maybe you, you don't ever pray. Maybe it's for you, it's, man, God's been speaking to me about praying. Well, how do you know God's speaking to me? First of all, he starts dropping it in your spirit. But if you don't hear it in your spirit, he'll bring people around you. And they'll start talking to you about your prayer life or whatever it might be. Is, is maybe it's reading the Bible. Your next step is reading the Bible. Start to get into the word. Let the word of God get into you so that when the storms come, you've got something to stand on. Maybe it's about getting in a small group, small groups that we offer. In fact, we're winding down this semester, but we'll be picking up in January again where you get in connection with some people so some people can encourage you. Maybe it's about serving. That Because you're so blessed and so thankful for what God's done that you're willing to serve others serve here at the church, serve in, in our city, wherever it might be, you're serving. Giving. They give of yourself. Give of yourself financially. Give of yourself emotionally. Or maybe it's leading. God's been speaking to you about, man, hey, your next step is to lead. I, I want to encourage you today. In fact, I'd really like to challenge you. Get involved in God's kingdom. Get involved. Learn, learn how to exercise your faith. When you learn how to exercise your faith, you're going to be amazed at the things in life that used to bother you that don't bother you anymore because your faith is growing stronger and your confidence in God is growing stronger. 
So I'm going to invite you, if you would, just stand up. And uh, right where you're at, do you mind bowing your head? No one moving around. I'd like to pray over you today. And the thing that I'd like to pray over you today is that you take your next step. That you recognize that God is leading you, that where you've been, the success you've had, and the, the, and the where you've enjoyed life has been great. But God has more for you. He, he's got more that he wants you to walk in, more that he wants you to be responsible for, more that he wants you to step into. But you got to be willing to take your next step. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And Lord, I pray over every person that is watching this, whether they're here today or they're watching online. God, I pray that you'd begin to speak to their heart, God, about what their next step is. Maybe it's to pray, read their Bible, get in a small group to serve, to give, to to lead, whatever it might be, God. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would download into their heart, God, a, a fresh desire to step into everything that you have for them. God, they, they, they've been complacent long enough. They've been in a rut long enough. Lord, I pray that you give them the courage to step out and exercise their faith, to watch miracles show up in their life, God, in incredible ways. So God, speak to each and every one of our hearts and let us be encouraged today. God, let us have some courage well up on the inside of us that we take hold of to overcome every obstacle in our marriage, God, in our families, in our health, God, in our finances. And believe you, God, for great and mighty things. So God, teach us how to exercise our faith today, I pray.